Folks, we're back. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas. We're third show today. Um, we have John Hunt, who is a candidate for Clark County District Court Department 18. And you guys know how we love those courts. We love the courts. No, seriously, we do. And uh, we love to find out about the courts because those are those are all the way at the end of the ballot and people don't even know who these candidates are. They're like John Hunt. Who's that guy, you know? And, and oh, I don't like that name, and they check something else, you know? But we wanna make sure that, that, that you know the name, face, and exactly what these candidates are about. So when you go to the polls, or mail-in ballot, you have, you have an education on, on these candidates. So today is John Hunt, who's running for Clark County District Court, department number 1-8. And uh, we're going to interview Mr. Hunt and find out what he's about and why he's running. Okay, John Hunt, how you doing today, sir? Good, good. How are you? Good. Tell us about yourself and don't leave anything out. All right, I won't. I won't. Because you know I've known you for years. I know. I know. Okay? Uh, and you know I, I sat in on, on on all your appointments right. when you were when you were you know appointed to when I was nominated. Nominated. And and also thanks to this organization for supporting me then. But for everybody that's out there listening and watching, little I little about me. Um, one of six kids. My dad worked in a shoe shop. My Were you mom, the youngest or the oldest? I was a middle child. Middle child. Right. I, my I, my uh, dad worked in a shoe shop. My mom worked in a textile mill. My dad worked uh, in the shoe shops, and he was a hand sewer. What state was he? I grew up in the state of Massachusetts. I was born in Brockton, Massachusetts, mm. home of Rocky Marciano and Marvin Hagler. Tough town. Tough town. Yeah. And yeah, those um, are two tough guys. Yeah, they only had yeah. two tough guys in the whole town. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but they were famous. That's true. M my dad and mom were just solid people, right and wrong, good and bad. My dad didn't tolerate any middle. Bull crap. It, no bull crap. My dad, when I was growing up, uh, always told us since we were this high, he gave us what I, he called the 90 day rule. The 90 day rule was 90 days from graduating from high school, you'd be doing one of three things. One, you'd, you'd have a job. Mm -hmm. Two, you'd be in college. Then he'd say, sorry, I have no dough. Or three, you'd be in the military. On the third, on the 91st day, I was in an airplane going to Lackland Air Force Base. I was in the United States Air Force for four years. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. I, I didn't. No? But I know exactly yeah, where so Lackland I, is. My, I, my brother served in okay. the Air Force. And so, uh, was in the Air Force for four years, went to school every single night. I Why'd was you go to the Marine Corps? Why? Because I was an Air Force kind of guy. Okay. You like <laughs> you know clean what? nails, huh? Well, you know what? You like your hair brushed? Well, uh, no, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, I really think that, you know, people decide things on what branch to go because they have different goals and desires to satisfy them as a man, right? right? Or a woman. Or a woman, right. And I think that, you know, there are people that are born warriors. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that they got to be a Marine. Like my son, my son it was a sniper in oh. the 82nd Airborne. He was in Fallujah and Iraq. God and, bless him. Yeah, and he, and, and, but he had that. He had that. Cause, and and my, uh, my dad was Navy. He was in the World War II. Okay. Uh, my brother, my, old, my oldest brother, he was in the 7th Cav in Vietnam. He died from exposure to Agent, Agent Orange. Yep. Yeah. And so my history is blue collar, uh -huh. serve the country, serve, you know, do the right thing, you know, and that's what it was. And then I came to Vegas in 1976. So, so, so John, you had your dad that was in the Navy. Navy. Uh, right. A real 
hard worker. Oh yeah, Luke my Power dad worked, would work with his hands. Probably well, we got used, calluses well, all over. We used, I'll tell you a story. I got to tell you the story. My dad and I, we worked together. We he, we hung windows and doors. Okay, and I told you, my dad, right or wrong, good or bad. So one day we were in Lowell, Massachusetts, and we used to hang storm windows. And he, I would, my job was to put eleven holes in the in the casing, cock it, give it to my dad. He'd go up this ladder, one hand with a, with a window, put it on, screw it in before there was electric drills, right? So one day I decided, you know what? Yeah, you don't need eleven holes. Seven should be enough, right? right? I gave it to him. He goes up the ladder. Window comes down, misses my head about this much. Oh. He comes bounding down the, the ladder, grabs me, and he says, do you know what character is? Because one day I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I'd say, oh, reputation, what people think of you in the community. He goes, that's bullshit. Character is something you have when no one's looking, and you just failed. And he fired me on the spot. Yeah, because you're supposed to put 11, not 7. Don't well, you not a And I had the thumb home, 60 And you went miles. into the Air Force? You're supposed to be smart people. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so that's it. And when I came to Vegas, I'm UNLV. Okay. I have my undergraduate degree in accounting. Okay. I, um, I uh, worked for the greatest trial lawyer in the history of Nevada, and the Who's third, that? Mort Gillane. I thought you were going to say Oscar Goodman. Now, <laughs> Oscar worked for Mort. Oh, oh okay. I mean, Mort Gillane was the greatest lawyer. I did his eulogy with Oscar and Wayne Newton, and I told all those people in there that, you know, everybody says Mort was a great lawyer, but I, I'm telling you he's the best. Okay. And if anybody disagrees with me, I'll be happy to meet you outside. Oh boy! <laughs> so I was I, so I was fortunate. I like this guy. <laughs> that, no, no Facebook thing, huh? No little so, thing. He's like, no, we going outside. Right. And so, so my thing, you know, during the course of my thirty-six years of practice, I've been blessed to live in Las Vegas. Deep roots. I ran for attorney general. I was one vote. How'd you do? I got beat by Sandoval. Right, okay. and then I I lost to Wolfson as a finalist. You know, if you would have beat Sandoval, he wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have been governor. Probably not. Well, it's he all. I wouldn't have been federal judge either. Right. Well, uh, maybe no. I I kind of disagree with that. Uh, right. Brian, I, I I always have known Brian. But you know, people's courses change. Right, they do. Yeah, yeah. and same thing. If yeah. I would have won, who knows where I would. Who know where you would have been? Yeah. Maybe you would have been governor. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But but why I'm here today mm -hmm. is because I believe that judges. Judges. My father used to say, "Give back to the community." I, I still want to hear more about your bio because you're missing a. Okay, place. all right. So I, for, for, so I come to Las Vegas, uh -huh. uh, 1976. Go to UNLV. 76. Who was president back in 76? Uh, 76. Uh, Ford, Ford was. Ford. Yeah. Was Ford? Ford was. That was your kind of sharp yeah. under this one. Yeah. Had national stuff going on. <laughs> oh yeah. Now I can name. I can name our presidents. So. Uh, he had Carter earlier. Right. He's got well, Ford. Carter, yeah. Well, Ford was right before Carter. So. <laughs> Uh, and going to UNLV, and then I worked at the Gaming Control Board, right, as an auditor. Okay. Right? Have uh, you ever seen that movie, you Casino? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I'm good with numbers. Okay. You know what it is, though, when, when you come from a family that had nothing? Because I tell people, I've been blessed to be everything from being on welfare wow. to being to the White House. Okay. I've had an ex and that's what, those are the things that make a judge a special. And what do you it's mean to the White House? What do you mean by that? Meaning, uh, you know, I worked in the Senate. I worked in the Senate, and I had my opportunities to go to the White House and okay. and those type of things. And for somebody who is a street kid, you know, from New England, to have to come to Las Vegas, get that opportunity because you could have those opportunities in Las Vegas. That's why we all came here. It's the greatest city in the world. It is. And uh, for me, d during that time to go through that. So I worked in the Senate, then I went, uh, I uh, was at, graduated, went to law school. Okay. Uh, I have been involved in every aspect of law that you can possibly imagine. I've, uh, I've done bankruptcies, I have done uh, appeals, I've done uh, appeals to the uh, Nevada Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and while we did the Wayne Newton NBC libel trial, I've been also been admitted to the United States Supreme Court. Oh. And I also, as you know, uh, I, I serve as a pro tem judge in Justice Court as well as Municipal Court, and when I go there, they say to me, oh, will you do 
traffic, like it's something like not, not good, I go, absolutely, I want to do traffic. Because I think that, and so I can honestly say I've done everything from traffic court to being admitted to the United States Supreme Court. I have argued appeals in the, in the Nevada Supreme Court, Nevada Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I've represented the Union Pacific Railroad. I have, I have was, my, my, my firm was responsible for the sale of the marina to the MGM. I've been involved, you name it, I, I think I've done it. And that's why my dad, I always remember my dad because he says, you know, at some point in your career, right, give back. You know, and this is my time to give back. You also it, were politically involved. I was politically involved, right, because I ran for AG, mm -hmm. right, and I, I put my hat in for the district attorney, and I have been involved politically. But I always tell people and this. And you were also county chair. I was county chair. But it's so funny when you talk about, and I tell people, you know, the reason you, you have to decide which extreme you can tolerate, and then you pick a party. Right. right and and to me I'm a moderate <laughs> I'm a middle of the road Which guy is extreme you right. could tolerate right that's, that's, right. Right. that's, that's a how you very pick. good way to put it actually. and so example for me <laughs> yeah yeah and so for me I remember because I was active I remember being on television with Ralston he and I used to go at it all the time. I don't like that guy but, but listen to the story it's interesting <laughs> so he says to me after I was no longer the the chairman he said okay, John, so what's the biggest problem in politics? And I said, that's simple. The extreme left and the extreme right yell so loud, they hijack the center. That's we, true. we, as I, you know, someone said the other day, okay, well, you may be this, you may be that. Let me tell you what I am. I'm first an American. Mm -hmm. I'm second in Nevada. I'm third, I'm a Las Vegan. And fourth, I am affiliated with a political party. That does not mean that no matter what- I thought what, you were gonna throw in parent, husband. No, no, I think, I, as far as your philosophy. Gotcha. You know, be, be, your personal things always is, be true to your God, be true to your lover, be true to your kids, raise them to know what's right and wrong. Right. Okay, I'm kind of a basic kind of guy. But I also have been blessed to have been exposed to so many things over time that this is my time to serve the community. Do you think judges should have term limits? Uh, I think that instead of term limits, they should be, there should be higher levels of experience before they can even qualify. To what do you mean by that? Uh, I don't think someone five years out of law school doesn't know where the bench is. See, the difference between me and somebody else is I'm, and you've seen it because you've been in court, these people are so inexperienced that you go in there, they're asking the clerk for the answer instead of telling the clerk where to go to get the answer. In my case, I'm ready. You know, I know just, uh, and, I, and I've done numerous trials. <laughs> I've just done I, it. I followed your career. Yeah. And so for me, that's the most critical thing is whether it's me or some, but just elect people that have experience and they can rule then, they can make decisions that are based upon empathy, not sympathy. And, and, and if, you're, if you have those tools, you can do one hell of a job. You know, I like I like that you said that because I actually I can't remember the exact date, but we actually had a guess on here one time that actually said that the law should be changed to where you don't even have to have a legal degree to be judge. Uh, you know, here's the deal. You don't, you wouldn't go into a restaurant and tell That's one tell of the somebody right? uh, uh, you don't have to learn how to cook. Can you make uh, me something to eat? <laughs> That'd be right. insane, right? You wouldn't go in and say, you don't have to have a medical degree to cut me open, right? <laughs> right. So someone saying that is saying that. Now, do I believe that there Unless are Unless they were saying the law is just common sense. <laughs> no, no, and it's, it, it, you know, and, and the same. Do I believe that there are people that have an innate sense of justice and equality and, and can t treat people with dignity and respect who should try to ascend to the bench, but you gotta hit, a carpenter's not gotta know how to build a, his, his craft before yeah. you say, go build me a house. Right. <laughs> you know? So, Mr. Hunt, know. so you're running for Department 18. Mm -hmm. Now, there were, 
I don't know if you're, you're you you got any family family court background. I, I do a lot. Okay. I have so, see that I've done a lot of family. So when I was listening to her case, it's the same thing. In family law, what do you usually get? You usually get someone who couldn't make it as a as a uh, lawyer. So they they get on the bench and mess up people's lives even worse. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. So their 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 entire the the entire Clark County District Court bench. Okay. Court was open for grabs. Okay. There's 52, 52 original seats, and they added another six in okay. the family. So there was 58 seats for you to pick from. Right. For right. the Clark County District Court. Right. Why Department 18? Thank you very much for asking that question. This is what I know, that last year there were 24,000 cases, civil cases filed in the district court. There were 8,000 criminal cases. My opponent was a lifelong prosecutor, right, and had zero experience, to the best of my knowledge, little or zero experience in the civil courtroom. Therefore, right now, right in the RJ poll, where they polled the attorneys, how do you rate this person? She, if, if, if you were on a letter numeric, 90 to 100 is an A, she had an F minus. She had a 58% rating by people, Probably not all her fault because she just doesn't have any civil experience. Two thirds hey, of that calendar. You're talking is, about Mary Kay Hope. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. Because uh, I, I, I know she was originally appointed. No. Wasn't she appointed? No, to that no, 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 no. She was not appointed. There, I hear that often. What happened? I could have sworn. No, no. What happened is Mark Bayless. Long time Las Who was Vegas. appointed? He, he was, was appointed. appointed, and then he was oh, on a very... Oh, she beat him. Right, and okay. he hadn't served for a long period of time. Yeah, and but, she beat him. You know, and so, you tie, hey, listen, one thing I do know, no matter who I am or what I do, it's really about timing. It's about timing. Is it, is it, is, are you, you know, when I ran for AG, I probably shouldn't have. Right. When somebody else then said later, John, you would have been a lock for Congress, right, or something else. I didn't run, so it's like, I, you know, I never really. But I always just wanted to serve, just serve, and I think that. So I, I have nothing bad to say about my opponent. I'm just saying that the amount of damage someone can cause to you in a civil case, <laughs> whether it's family, can be sometimes worse than a criminal case. I mean, and you as a member of the public, right, you shouldn't have to pay for their on-the-job experience. And, and so I'm, I'm ready. I do have criminal experience because sitting on the justice court as a pro tem, sitting on the municipal court, I, I, and I've done that for 10 years. And during that 10 years, I've never taken a dime. I give all the money to the Three Square Food Bank because there's a sense, my father gave me a sense of uh, gi giving back doing the right thing. What do you mean by that? You, you give all your money, what does that Well, mean? whatever I get paid for it, I don't take it. I give it to Three Square Food Bank. So, what, what are you saying if you, 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 if you, if you become elected? No, that's a, I do that, I'm saying I sit as a pro tem judge. Oh, you time. give, oh, you give your pro tem money, uh, money to, to, the, to the Three Square Food Bank, and I've done that since day one. Oh, that's very honorable. How, how much do they, how much do you get just well, to sit? Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know because I because I don't I don't care that I whatever I got I just signed the back of it and sent it to Three Square and done that for ten years. Uh, you don't know what they. I think it's uh, they have it for sessions, so I think it's like for doing a session could be three hundred dollars or so. That's it. Yeah, for the morning session, doing the afternoon session. But think of it this way: I'm really the, uh, the Three Square people told me, John, you have fed thousands of people. A hundred dollars will feed like three hundred people, mm -hmm. and so you know that's a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. So did did you say why you were running for eighteen? I did. did. I said I because I believe that the the reason why I'm running is because we need judges that have experience and experience in both areas, real experience, and and look at their their com, uh, community roots. Look at how they practice. Look at the areas they practice. Look at their personality. If they don't hold all these truths, all these tools, 
probably should be picking somebody so, else. So you, you're saying that your your, your opponent um, ha, has been in the public sector her For a whole, whole, whole career. career, right? So yeah. she doesn't know what it's like to sign the back of a never or sign the front of a check, actually. Or how about do a payroll? Or, do or how payroll. about how about do a payroll? How about uh, go to some complex commercial litigation? How about you know? And yet, if she's assigned that case, she's got it. How so, about trial? How about are are you are you? I the last in the last two years, I did two two one in, I did two jury trials, co counsels in uh, a railroad case in state court and also federal court. Fe uh, uh, federal uh, was F E L A. So you you you've been favorite. practicing law for how long now? Thirty six years. 36, that's a long time. Yeah. And, and during that- Oh, and I want to say something else. Uh -huh. My father, he said this, if someone's running for judge, one of the things you should ask them, is it a pay raise or a pay decrease? If they say it's a pay raise, walk away. Yeah. Wow. If someone's committed and say, if I'm elected, you know, I doing this for the community and I'm giving up more than I could get it just by getting that. I'm not a. I'm not going to be a career right. uh, uh, judge. If this, and when I, I'm old school, old school when I was brought up, judges were people who had 20, 30 years experience because it should be a capstone. It shouldn't be a stepping stone. Right. Yeah. But if it's a stepping stone, then in, someone doesn't have any experience either through only being a lawyer for five years or whatever, mm -hmm. and they run. There is no way anybody's ever going to convince, convince me that that's in the best interest of the public. Okay, so you you've been a you've been a public defend. I mean, sorry, not a public defender. You've been a defense counsel for that whole period. Of oh time. no, absolutely no. not. I've done malpractice cases, in, in uh, personal injury cases, plaintiff and defense. I've represent. No, no, that's the best thing mm -hmm. that I love about how I practice law. I you can't pigeonhole me because mm -hmm. I've done it. I've done it. If you go ahead, ask me anything, and I'll tell you if I've had a case and I can tell you what the law is in that area, right? Mm -hmm. And how so that when you come to in front and come to that my courtroom, hopefully, then you know that you're going to have the confidence that you know what I know he's got to be fair and I know he knows the law. Do you think judges should have um, um, judicial immunity and and the statute of limitation? You think they both should apply for? Uh, the, that's a very broad question. Uh, immunity, in a sense that we can't. Um, I believe in limited immunity. Okay. Okay. So if you're doing your job and it's within the four corners of your job, then you should have that immunity. So you can't be harassed by it, people just to file something or get rid of you as a judge. But if you're outside the parameters and you're a rogue, absolutely no immunity. Okay. I believe that in my heart. Okay. Have you ever been disciplined by the Never. state bar? Okay. Never. And what, 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 <laughs> besides being a, 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 a pro tem, what, what boards or have you set on? Because no, I, I brought, uh, I was on the board that brought uh, Father Flanagan's voice down here. Uh, I've been uh, on the, I do the payback program where I go into the community and c tell kids, you know, how important it is to keep an education and how all your dreams can come true. I do this little thing where I go in there and I walk in the room and I draw a pyramid on the board. And these kids, usually middle school, because that's the last time you really can, I think, affect somebody's course. Okay. Right? And I tell them, I go, okay. First I ask them, I go, so what do you think my mom and dad did for a living? And they'll say, oh, lawyer, doctor. I go, yep, no, nope, neither one of them has a, had a high school education. And I said, let me tell you something. If I could give you the secret to success today, would you take it? And these schools I go to are so hard school. Some of them don't raise the hand because they've been, and I was there because I lived in those tenement buildings. Right, right. You know, they're, they're, they're leery ever to give you a question. And I go, okay, so if I could give you the secret to happiness, would you take it? What is that I put on the board? They go, well, it's a triangle pyramid. And they go, education is like a pyramid, right? When, we st when you started first grade, we're all given a bucket. 
And I call that the bucket of knowledge. Now, here's the way that this works. I'm not here to talk to the kids that get straight A's and stuff, because they get the bucket theory. I'm here to talk to the people that were like me. I was a class clown, people that didn't get it. But I tell them that what the most important thing is about this country is that if you decide today if you want to fill up the bucket, you can go to the top of the pyramid. Then I give them numerous examples where filling up the bucket changed my life. Whether it was my dad, where I promised he I'd take him to the World Series. I, we could sit next to the Red Sox dugout when we used to sit in the bleachers that the game was a rumor, right? I said, why did that happen? And during the course of my speech to them, they start saying, and I say, well, why did that happen? It's like, uh, Chris Rock, I tell him. He says, you know what the difference between... You know Chris Rock? Very much. Between Chris Rock and... Uh, he says, you know what the difference between a job and a career is? I said, he says, a job sucks. You look at the clock and you wait for it to end. A career is at the end of the day, you go, where did the day go? Yeah. So what do you want? Do you want a career or you want a job? Now these kids are locking in. Right? And they, I, they all want a career. And I said, so how do you get a career? And then I give them other examples, you know, where people have come and I go, they, if you want to be listened to, the more you fill up your bucket, the more people will listen to your opinions, right? Because you garner respect to your knowledge, right? And at the end of my, my thing up there, I, I write my name on the board and I tell them, henceforth, I'm your attorney. But you can only do that if you fill up your bucket. And then I, get, I always brought a stack. I, do, I bring a stack of brand new $1 bills. I give every kid a $1 bill, right? And they go, oh, can we keep it? Can we keep it? I go, oh, let me ask you a couple questions. I said, so first. I was going to say a funny, but I. I the first it. question. With who, the $1 bills. <laughs> I say, who's on the front of the, on the $1 bill? And they all know. They all say with George Washington. I go, you think he filled up his bucket? He filled up his bucket. We not only changed our country, he changed the world. Now flip the dollar bill over. What's on the other side of the dollar bill? Pyramid. And I said, that eye on there, that's the all-knowing eye of knowledge. Henceforth, if you fill up your bucket, all your dreams can come true. I have letters in my, my desk right now from people that went to law school, that went to medical school, and they tell I get emotional. They tell me, Mr. Hunt, I filled up my bucket. What does so those are the time I'm really community oriented. What, 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 UNLV, I'm, I'm the vice president, president. I'm the pre, I'm the vice president of the UNLV alumni veterans alumni club. Established it because I said as a board member that the people at UNLV, when you look at, they go, who's the biggest college? And when I said, no, no, who's the biggest collective group on this on UNLV campus? You know who it is? Our veterans. And I said, they need a seat at the table. So I was instrumental in, in putting together a, uh, the UNLV uh, Veterans Alumni Association. And once we did that, then I went to the UNLV Alumni Association, the, you know, the, the flagship, and got them uh, uh, recognized. And so now they're an ad hoc member to the uh, UNLV Alumni Association. The, the current bench right now is 52 district court judges. How many of those judges are vets, do you know? I don't think there's men. I, Rob Bear is the only one that I know. He's the only one that I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. And how wrong is that? Because the same thing, talking to our vets out there. In the end, what do you want? You want somebody that's fair but understands you. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand vets. No, there's no, and I, you know, because it's been, if something has enveloped your whole life, you can't forget it when you take the bench. It's just like making sure vets, specialty courts, things of that nature, you know. I was always so supportive of that. This idea that, you know, George Washington said it best. You know what George Washington said? He said, a country that's, that does not honor its veterans is doomed to failure. Okay, speaking of that, what do you think about the Veterans Treatment Court? I think that, I think, great embryonic condition. It needs to really look at, you know, more of a putting a mental health aspect in it to help those vets, not just say, well, you did it because of this. How about you did it, but here's a program that we're going to assist you to help you 
because really, what is the biggest problem? We all know, it's like my, my own man. Those guys, the real veterans, you're probably a real veteran. I say I'm, an, I'm a veteran, but I'm an Air Force guy. You know, the real veterans, the people that did combat, they'll never want to talk about combat. My son, who was a sniper, never wants to talk. But you know when they talk about it? When you're sitting at a kitchen table and you're putting a fifth of, you know, Seagram 7 on there and you're drinking. At the end of the night, people are crying. Because they tell the stories, right? Right, right? And that's the kind of person you want sitting on the bench that knows that's the experience that that person, and that changes it from sympathy to empathy. And that's critical. What does a John Hunt, um, Judge John Hunt recusal list is going to look like? Uh, my recusal list is going to be based on freaking common sense if you know if there is something that i what if there is an appearance see here's the problem with these guys the rule is if there is an appearance of an impro impropriety you should recuse yourself i believe in that rule so if someone says to me you know well you know so and so and uh it, it, and can that affect your decision depends how far removed it is right if it's i'm going to be the first one to say adios you know because you you you, you it's so important that if people don't believe that you have character then they'll never believe in the system right and so that that's that's how I would approach recusal. <laughs> so there's another question that I wanted, but it, it kind of it, it kind of um, escapes me. But I think I got it. You being a judge and you're on the bench and and you see a, an, a, an attorney that did some type of corruption. Right. What are you going to do? That's before you. Uh, first of all, it's interesting. That's a great question because the first thing, like, is, well, I gave someone gave me a similar situation where they said the guy's impaired, right? He, no ineffective assistance of counsel. You, you first, you know, you come up here to the bench. Let's have a little talk here, right? And I will tell you that it's so important that you do the right thing and refer that to the state bar. So you would personally file something? Oh, absolutely. What absolutely. about if it's a judge? Doesn't matter. I will tell you this, when I ran for attorney general, it was very- So you, you, you hold, hold on something here, Mr. Hunt. So you said that- I thought you said you knew me. You said, you said, <laughs> well, I, I, want, I, want, I, want, I want the people to know you as well. Yeah, okay. You, 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 you would also file a complaint against a sitting judge of the judge. Absolutely, and I'll give you an example. Uh, it's because you're not it, just saying. No, that's this. that's true. Because because a, a it, lot it, a lot a lot judges tell me they don't file a complaint right, against another right, judge because they don't want the backlash. Too bad. They don't want judges to gang up on them. Too bad. And have somebody and that's run, why, run against them in a, in a that's in why, upcoming election. That's why if it's a capstone and not a stepping stone, you're going to do the right thing. Right. And that's critical. It, when I was running for AG, they asked this one question. I'll never forget it. Because... Um, in a debate with, with Brian, and the question was, uh, would you support any law uh, passed by the legislature? And I think Brian maybe got caught up in it, and he goes, yeah, I'd support any law passed by the legislature. And they, and because he thought that maybe was the right answer that he, the people wanted to hear. My answer, if something is patently unconstitutional, I'd sooner resign than enforce it. Right. Yeah, I think what Brian, I watched that. And, and then, I watched yeah, that. and then later, a week later, it, it was funny because now we're you know just talking stories and stuff. Right. Uh, a week later, they asked Brian. Uh, the RJ, I think, said to him, uh, "Okay, you said you'd enforce any law." He said, "Yeah." He goes, "What if they required Jews to wear the Star of David? Would you enforce that?" He goes, "It would be my job to enforce it." <laughs> now that day, I thought I was the Attorney General, <laughs> but I, you know, I that was the first time I ever ran for office. It was a great experience. My yeah. kids, it was good. So to me, it's like, and I, and I, even when I saw him the next day, I go, "I don't think he meant that." 
And see, that's, that's honest, too. Like Brian and I, I'll never forget, when he got appointed for the federal judge, I remember the RJ calling me because they wanted to mix things up. They go, oh, oh what do you sure. think of Harry appointing Brian as the uh, federal judge? I go, I said, Brian's got to be a great judge. He's measured, middle of the road, and that's the kind of judges we need. You know? so, so would you legislate from the bench? Uh, the question is, I think every judge has a responsibility to follow the law. Because if you get mixed messages because you don't follow the law, then how can they have anybody walk in your courtroom and have any faith in what you're going to do? Uh, I do, if you're asking me, do I think that at some times I'm a constitutionalist at heart, right? But I also believe what Thomas Jefferson said: we can't wear the same coat we wore as a child as we wear as a. So are you? Adult. Are you a constitutionalist? Do you believe in the U.S. Constitution? A bullfrog. Would you food? apply the U.S. Constitution yeah, right. in your rulings? Right. Absolutely. So Absolutely. you believe in the first, second, third, Absolutely. fourth, fifth, sixth, eight, all the way to the fourteenth amendment? Absolutely. Every one of them. Okay. Every one of them, I, I, every single one of them, because we were blessed to have this document put it before us so that we can. Now, I will tell you, the extreme left and the extreme right, they're pretty fast and loose with what they think oh. is constitutional, right? Okay. But I think that what you want is somebody that looks at the Constitution and stays where they, I think they meant it to stay, which is what is the, a constitutional view for what is in the best interest of our citizens. That's how you temper it. But you follow it, you know. Even if you don't like it. Oh, even yeah, there's a lot of things I don't like that <laughs> my old man told me, you know. It's just like my father used to say, just because you do the right thing, don't expect not to get a bloody nose. Right. You don't always you don't always get a pat on the back. And how far how far would you use your discretion in a ruling? If I believe that something is innately unjust, I'm using my discretion. And I'll suffer whatever the consequence. Even if it means going against the, the well, law that's it before. No, because I can tell you, no matter what, there will be a basis. I can't just pull it out of the air and say, you know, no, there's got to be a sound basis for exercising that discretion, even though on its face it might seem like it's a deviation. And how do you look at rule of evidence? Uh, do you follow the rule of oh, evidence? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Do, 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 well, do, you see it down in family court. There's no such thing as evidence. No. <laughs> do, 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 do you have, do, would, you, do you, would, you, would you demand that, that both plaintiff and defendants prove their allegations? Well, here's the, here's the best thing about this situation is because of my 36 years of experience, I know every burden of proof for every level of the law that you would possibly be engaged in. From administrative law, which I've done a ton. I represent all these doctors, healthcare professionals to the board. I was the prosecutor for the dental board for 25 years. And during that time, so I know it from the bottom to burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt and I have the capacity to know what evidence is necessary on each one of those levels because I have experience at each one of those levels could you tell a pedophile just by looking at them I no. got that from Mike Davis. No, that's that's, that's ridiculous. No, no, you can't. No, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Do you have anything else for Mr. Hunt? No, actually, uh, it, I really, uh, as if, and Steve said this about presidents and like more on the national. Steve, uh, Steve knows more about the judge thing than I do. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about you coming in is if you notice, like, I, I listen more. Because Steve covered everything that I was going to say. I just really appreciate you coming in, and I really. Now I'm not going to. Now I'm going to get all choked up. <laughs> it, I'll never antiquate myself with with you because the level of success that you've obtained. Although I'm not trying to be mean, you are a little bit older than I am. Yes, I am a little <laughs> long in the tooth. <laughs> but uh, I really like what you had to say about your upbringing because it's one of the things that uh, 
I had somebody uh, say to me the other day at work that was very touching to me. They said, you know, the thing about you, James, is you're a very strict leader. You're very tough on us, but you're also very fair and you're also very empathetic. And I said, well, a lot of that comes from the fact that you got to realize that in this profession, I started gathering carts and bagging groceries. Right. So I've come up through the whole right. thing. So I understand each level. So I understand what you're going yeah. through. Yeah. So I, I appreciate and I, that. And I like that about you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate those kind words. Would you bring your... Because we all have biasness. Right. Everybody would, has biases and prejudices. Would you, yeah. would you bring that to the bench? Uh, I, will, I will bring my collective experience to the bench. And if, if you know, it was just like, again, I go back to my father. He used to say, never remember the day I died. Just remember how I live. Forget, try to remember the good that I've done and forget Try to forget the bad, you know. So the things about prejudice and biases, the most important thing is recognizing that you have them and then you realize that you cannot, you cannot extrapolate that onto other people in a fair and an unfair right manner now the because those same biases and prejudice give you some empathy I'll give you an example sitting on the bench uh, someone comes in right domestic violence case okay well I'm gonna I have to decide whether to put him in jail for 90 days now Again, I brought my bias and prejudice to the bench because growing up in the tenement buildings in New England, you know, and I'm talking tough, and I saw domestic violence. I saw, you know, those things happen. So that, is that a bias or a prejudice? I think so. So I'm standing there, and like I told you, like I was telling the lady before, the way that I sentence people is I look if they have a book of business. If they don't have a book of business, book of business. if you don't have a book of business, then I'm going to exercise a lot of discretion. I'm not committed to some standard, here's this, this, there. Look at the person. Give them the opportunity to become a better person. And if they don't want to become a better person, no problem, I can throw the book at them. But you know, this in this one case, the guy came in and I looked, he's got no book of business, right? And I look at her, and he brings her, the wife in, because a lot of times they'll do that. Don't throw him in jail because then he's going to lose his job and whatever, right? And I always try to think of ways a little outside the box because uh, there's, there's better ways to serve justice for everyone. So the, I realize he doesn't have a book of business, but I realize she's there and she doesn't want to, uh, you know, have him go to jail, even though it beat the crap out of her, right? And I say to her, I go, you know what? From Monday to Friday, he's a pretty good guy, isn't he? And then on Friday, he gets the paycheck. Remember, this is, I'm now extrapolating my buy. He gets the paycheck, blows it, come home, and then takes it out on you. Isn't that kind of true? And she was starting to cry. And I said, so, and I looked at him, I go, I know you're frustrated that you can't make it as a working man and woman with the money that you're, you're doing. So I, I'll, I'll buy that. But today, this is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you decide. There's two doors here, the one that goes out the back, you go home, and the one here to the right where you go to the Great Power Motel. So you're going to decide which one. And here's what it is. Here's, you got to decide. Okay, first thing, what we're going to do is I'm going to have you, if you want, you're going to report to the Clark County Detention Center on Friday. They're going to release you on Monday for the next six months instead of doing 120 days in jail the weekend. Oh, right? I see what you're doing. So, so now I say, or you can just take the 90 days. You decide. What do you want to do? I think he's Monday through Friday at home and check in on yeah. Friday night to the jail. <laughs> right, that's exactly it. You know, and so he took and, that. And he saved his job. But, and meanwhile, I got in trouble because remember, I'm a pro dem. So I, I, you know, Why'd you get in trouble? Because I gummed up the, the jail system. You gave him a choice. No, but I, I'm, I'm doing something that nobody and, and, else and is you, doing. And you, 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 you took care of Everything. One rock, right. yeah. two birds. Exactly. He Made saved his job and, and, and he's and, paying and he's, for his and, he, and, he, and she smiled and he will become a better person. And he's not getting drunk on Friday. Exactly. How did I do that? I brought my bias and prejudice to the bench. Right. Yeah. 
Well, you made you made it work for the betterment. Exactly, exactly. Because it's just like I think that you know it, we talk about in criminal justice system. You know, this is a recent case, the Jimenez case in Nevada Supreme Court, right? I have always said that for working men and women and poor people and people of color, bail means jail. Bail means jail. And you know what? We wouldn't have, and now that case that just came out, they said now the burden of proof is going to be on the prosecutor to justify the amount of bail. Used to be they just in wrote, right? Yeah. But here's the real problem. The real problem is because we don't have experienced judges who are making that threshold decision whether to exercise their discretion to give someone a, a release on their own recognizance. If you had the judges with the courage that said, okay, he's got no book of business. He's not a flight risk. This isn't a crime that he, the victim's going to be, in, in, you know, you, you, re, you, re, you do all those things and it should say only one thing. Released on your own recognizance. So you don't lose your job, you don't lose your family, the, the community is served better. So, you know, those are the things that, you know, you, that are policy decisions that even from the bench, like if I get elected, I'm not a guy that's gonna be inside that courtroom and you don't see me ever again. I'm out there in the public educating kids, educating high school, educating seniors. Here's the process. I know it scares the crap out of all of you, but let me tell you what you can expect. So you're going to be a public judge then? Well, I'm going to be a judge that serves the people of the state of Nevada, and that's what I'm going to be. Okay. Okay. Because I, I, I could go, I could go on, but <laughs> I could, I, I could, I could, I could talk about the current atmosphere that's going on right now with the looting, the rioting. Um, um, okay. Uh, police and reform, okay. And let me tell you about that. Let, and let all me tell that. you exactly what this is. Okay. What you have to have is judges who have the courage. First, we were in the military. What's the most, most sacred thing we, we fought for and, and tried to protect our freedom, freedom of speech? But that does not mean that if you are not a peaceful protester, that you are not held accountable. If you destroy property, if you inflict any harm on anyone else during this Exercise of your free speech. You're going to jail. Mm -hmm. You're going to jail, mm -hmm. right? So it's like that. And the same token, when you look at, it, you go. You also have the, the 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 judges that have to have the courage to say, "Wait a second. If if there's a policeman who is rogue over the thing, you got to step up and protect the public from that person too." Yeah. So it, what is that all about? Really, all I'm telling you is what should be common sense. Right. You have to have judges that have the courage to recognize free speech. Judges have the courage that, that says that I'm going to hold you accountable and throw you in jail if you destroy property or inflict any kind of harm on anybody else during that process. And judges that are looking at the police that say, if your conduct is so egregious, I, I represent the police department. I, not the police, I represent the police officers in the union. I do all of the shootings for the uh, Henderson Police Department, the Highway Patrol. So I understand. You know, you, we're not there to second guess somebody. That's, that's, that's not what it's about. It's about looking at the facts, looking at it, and don't be, now there's where the biases and prejudice, don't be driven by your biases and prejudice either to overly prosecute them or under prosecute them. All right, well, Mr. Hunt, this has very, been a very intriguing conversation to say the least. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I did too. And um, I'll probably get in trouble somewhere along the line. You know, we're, we're, we're all <laughs> get in trouble one time yeah. or another. Yeah, I mean, that's never been my fear. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't like puppets, especially puppets on the bench. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, who does? If there's a lot of people that oh, like true enough, puppets. there are people that think that they control those people, yes. and that's why it should be a capstone, not a stepping stone, yes. because those people then become beholding to them. Yes. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like term limits for judges, but that's either here nor there. But could you look into the camera yeah. and, and, and tell those folks why they should go to the, because you, you, you encompass the entire Clark County, Laughlin, right. Ski, Mount Charleston, Prim, Gene, Boulder, Henderson, yeah. the whole entire Clark County. So you got the, every, once you walk out these doors of this building, 
and, and in here, everybody out there is a potential voter because Absolutely. this is a nonpartisan right. seat that you're running for, right. especially we're going into the general election. Could you look into the cameras and tell folks why, why it is so important for them to circle your bubble right next to your name, put it in that secure sleeve envelope, put it in that postage paid envelope, sign, date, whatever they got to do, print their name on the back of the envelope, put in U.S. mail before November 3rd at 7 p.m. Tell them why they need to vote for you and, and, and your point of contact. Okay. I think that what's really critical is that this isn't about me. You have an opportunity to look at the credentials of a judge, know their experience, whether they have deep roots in the community. Are they enabled so that when they take the bench, they're ready to go? I'm that person, 36 years, been in Las Vegas, 44, Air Force veteran, raised three kids here, practiced law in every kind of aspect you can possibly imagine. As I said earlier, I've done everything from traffic court to being admitted to the United States Supreme Court. But not just me. What I'm really asking you all to do is vote for those people that have that kind of experience to make this community a fair, equal place where when you go to court you're treated with dignity and respect because that's what it's about so I hope you vote for me my name's John Hunt I'm running for department 18 point of contact point of contact uh, John Hunt for judge dot com <laughs> folks that's John Hunt he's running for Clark County District Court Department 18 and folks we really we really need you to pay attention to these judicial candidates because they sit on the bench for six years and they affect your life immediately immediately they could throw you in jail they could have you lose your job they could evict you from your from wherever you're staying they could they could garnish your bank account they could do so much to you they could take your kids they could do a lot of stuff to you so we really 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 need to educate ourselves on these judicial candidates that are on bottom of the ballot but we really need to scroll down and look at every single name and you know what if, if you have a problem and you can't find out what judge you want, just give me a call and I'll give you my best opinion. Believe me, my opinion is going to be truthful, direct, to the point. You can even call up Jim. He'll give you his opinion. To, or you can go to veteransandpolitics.org and click on the endorsement and we'll have a list of judges and, and, and candidates in the non-races, not non-partisan, <coughs> the partisan races as well for recommendation and endorsement. So we encourage everybody to go and pay attention to these ju judicial candidates especially. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas for Veterans and Politics. That was John Hunt, Clark County District Court, Department 18. Until next time. <laughs>